Right, I'm going to kick off because we haven't got long and I'm doing a bit of a whistle-stop tour. So for those of you who don't know me, which isn't that many of you, but I'm Kate Middleton and I work here and also with uh, Mind and Soul. I'm one of the directors of Mind and Soul. We're a national organisation working with the church and mental health. So if you haven't come across us yet, check us out, mindandsoul.info. And we've also recently launched the Mental Health Access Pack which is mentalhealthaccesspack.org. Bit of a mouthful there. But that's a free resource for churches, anything and everything to do with mental health. If the question you want answered isn't already answered on there, email me and tell me and we'll add it to the phase three, which we're just starting to write now. So they're two useful websites, men, uh, mentalhealthaccesspack.org and mindandsoul.info, both of which I've been involved with. But for today, we're going to do a whistle-stop tour of the teenage brain. Because, now I have, the, a lot of you will know my kids, I've got a 10-year-old daughter um, and a 4-year-old son. So I'm at this really interesting phase of child and adolescent development because both my children can have tantrums at the same time. This is a real joy and not something I think I've thought through entirely because my 10-year-old is just going into the wonderful world of adolescence and my son is still, still at nearly four in the age of toddlerhood and tantrums, which we thought would all be done by now, but no, apparently it lasts longer. So interestingly, they represent the two stages in life where the human brain changes the most. Admittedly, my son, you would have thought would have been done by now, but two, age two to three and then into adolescence, we used to think that in adolescence, um, that basically after my son's age, the human brain was relatively stable, not that much change happened. But in the last decade or so, with the changes in imaging technology, we've been able to realize that actually the teenage brain is undergoing the same kind of dramatic changes as my son's brain is undergoing. So what I want to take you through is a little bit of what that means and what, therefore, we can expect at each stage of development. And I will refer it back to my son's stage, because if you think of what we're talking about, the whole phase of childhood through to adulthood is one long stage of gradual change. You wouldn't expect my son, unfortunately, to go to bed one day a baby and wake up a child, he goes through this phase of change and of learning about the world. And it's the same for my daughter. She's not going to go to bed one day and then wake up an adult. Instead, we've got years of this to come where she's gradually changing and gradually learning more and understanding more. And her brain is literally changing day to day. So I want to start off by telling you about five things that are going on in the childhood brain. So how are children's brains different from ours? What are some of those changes about that by the time my daughter becomes an adult, her brain will be different from what my son's is like at the moment? So I'm going to do five things about that, and then we'll talk about five things that are going on in the adolescent brain. So this will be quite rapid, those of you who are keeping notes. So bu buckle your seatbelts, we're off. So the first thing about the childhood brain is that it is very what we, um, I'm a psychologist by background, now we talk about children's brains being egocentric. That means that from my son's perspective, he can only take one perspective of the world and he is at the center of it. Everything that happens in his life is because of or related to him. I know there are some adults who are still like that. But they have a choice. They do. My son has no choice. That's his only perspective on the world. So kids, as they grow up, they start to gradually realize that there are other perspectives on the world. But still, they, they, they don't, their immediate uh, state of mind is to think of things from their own perspective. You see it as they get older. So they get better at lying. So we've got the kid with chocolate all around his mouth. There's a great classic psychology experiment where you put the kid and a chocolate cake in a room. And then you go out as the experimenter to do something. And you come back in. And the kid looks a bit like this. And you say, did you eat any of the chocolate cake? And they go... No. <laughs> and my son today, when I came in and said, who emptied that entire box of Lego all over the floor? And he just looked at me and said, it definitely wasn't me. <laughs> so he has got past one of his stages of childhood development in that he now knows that my perspective is different from his. This is something called theory of mind. It's a really classic stage of childhood. He, he understands that well, so he can now lie because he knows that I wasn't there when he did tip the Lego out of the box. So he can say that it wasn't him and I don't actually know. As we see as they get older, and particularly moving into early adolescence, the first stage of the beginning of this adolescent 
comprehension that other people have a totally different perspective from them is when you see kids hit the embarrassment phase. Who has kids of their own or in their group who are in this phase? My daughter is in the embarrassment phase. So the other day, all the kids in our church came and they were all dancing at the front to their music. And my daughter looked, didn't she, Becky, like she might actually die. She was horrified. Every other kid's like, yeah, yeah, she's just not happy. She is in this phase. So when they come out of the egocentric phase and they suddenly become aware that everybody else has a perspective on them and they're mortified and they feel like they're in a spotlight. So that's how you know that they're coming out of this phase. Number two about children is to do with their attention. Children, when they're very little, really struggle with attention. My son the other day, because, you know, I was getting frustrated with him, I thought, I'm a psychologist, let's measure his attention span. So I sat with him one-to-one. He was getting full-on attention, and I timed him. Nine and a half minutes. No wonder I'm having such trouble when I'm trying to do a Sainsbury shop with him for an hour. So kids at his, at his age, they really struggle with attention, some more than others. Classically, boys more than girls, but not exclusively. Some kids really struggle with this, and they have to learn, and they have to be taught. So my son is in nursery school, and one of the things that he is hopefully learning is how to sit still, preferably for more than 10 minutes, so that when he goes into reception, he'll be able to concentrate. So kids need to learn this, and they struggle with this. Some of them struggle because they get utterly absorbed in something and really don't like being moved on. Others, like my son, just they flip from one thing to another all day. That's what they do. And as they get older, they've got to get better at controlling that. When we move into adolescence, of course, what you see is that they love to do about 100 things at once. When's the last time you saw any adolescent doing just one thing? They're always doing pretty much what they're doing and texting, as far as I can work out. So this is when they think they can do loads of things at once, but they're still discovering about their attention, so they're not quite as good at that as they think they are. But they're able to apply their attention a little bit better at this age. Number three for kids is about cause and effect. So kids' brains are very, very literal and quite simplistic. They like to believe that everything is predictable in their world. And really that's part of making the world feel safer and more secure for them. So my son believes that everything is in the control of this great, wonderful person called Mummy. As long as Mummy is calm, he's not bothered at all because I can do anything in his eyes. Kids at this age, they love anything that's cause and effect, so light switches on and off, the sort of things that drive you absolutely crazy as a parent, you know, balls against wall, bounce, 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 you know, and just when you're about to go crazy. That's, that's why they love it. What they struggle with at this age is inconsistency. So they find it very hard to understand that, for example, emotions can change who mummy is. One day, I don't mind bounce, bounce, bounce for half an hour while I'm trying to listen to the radio and cook tea. Another day, after two minutes, I go absolutely mental. He doesn't understand that because he expects me to be consistent and he expects that of his world. So kids classically struggle if they see inconsistency between rules, between different adults, even between different days. They find that very hard to understand. As they get older, of course, teenagers are slightly better at managing this, but they are about pushing the line all the time. So teenagers understand consistency, but they want to test your limits. So their understanding of boundaries has totally changed, and their position on them has changed as they're starting to become adults, and they're starting to think about their own perspectives on this. And, of course, they then become probably the most inconsistent being in your household because one day they can be one person and the other day a completely different person. So it's all up for change. Number four for kids is that what we have to understand, they don't understand abstract concepts. Younger children, like my son, find it very, very difficult to understand abstract concepts, and they don't really have that abstract thought. So... What do I mean when I'm talking about abstract concepts? Time, for example, is a very abstract concept. When I say to my son, we need to leave in two minutes or we'll be late, he has pretty much no idea what I mean, which is why two minutes later he's still wandering around with no trousers on. And I really need him to be in the car ready to go. Admittedly, I have that problem with other members of my family, although less with trousers, just with general timekeeping. But so there are some concepts that we as adults want them to understand that are very abstract. This is why the star chart becomes your best friend in childhood, because what we're doing there is we're turning abstract concepts into really concrete reality. So if you're ready when I tell you that we need to leave the house, you get a star. That they understand. Of course, another abstract concept that we expect our children to understand a lot about is emotions. Emotions. 
Now, to my son, when I start talking about emotions, he has no idea what I mean, or at least hopefully he has some idea. My son and I have been working a lot on emotions because of his lying on the floor and screaming quite a lot. So now when he gets cross, he will stand and shout at me and say, Mommy, I am very frustrated. And I say, oh, that's great. Good that you've told me that. Why are you frustrated? And he thinks for a while. And then almost every time he goes, I'm frustrated with you. <laughs> and I don't really know where to go after that. But anyway, he is starting to learn the concept of emotions. He's learning the concept of frustration. And he's learning to link that with the abstract concept of what he feels like in that moment. And hopefully, hopefully he will start to learn some constructive things to do with his emotions as well. Of course, when they go into adolescence, their emotions start to change. And his emotions are really quite simplistic. He's basically either happy, sad, angry, or calm occasionally anxious, although he doesn't really understand that one very well. It tends to come out as angry for my son. And a lot of children will do that. They'll simplify emotions and a more complicated emotion that they can't understand, they can't complain, will just come out as cross, which is why so often what we see in younger children is behavioral issues, when in fact there's something more complex going on underneath. Okay, number five for kids is really interesting, this one. This is about kids' understanding of reality. And my son's version of reality is entirely what I and the other adults around him control. So when they're very little, they don't even understand that that reflection in the mirror is them. They, they start to understand that as they get older. And their self-concept is so fluid at this age. And this is why they love to dress up. You know, when kids put on the, you know, the Scooby-Doo costume or whatever it is, they, they don't just put a costume on, they become that character for a moment. It's that exciting to them. And what's interesting, therefore, is that their version of what's real is totally up for grabs. So is my son a good boy or is he a problem kid? Is he trouble? That version of reality to him is entirely up for grabs. It depends totally what he learns from the other humans around him. So you might see kids who have been told something about themselves or about the world that you disagree with, but to them, that's totally real. It's as real as, as the solidity of the floor or whatever it is to you and me. To them, that's real. So we have to understand their understanding, not just of reality, but of truth. What's the truth about them? And as they go into adolescence, their understanding of that becomes a bit more sophisticated. Sophisticated, and if there have been problems, we can start to discuss with them some of that stuff. So that's five things about kids. So let's move on and think, therefore, what about adolescence? So we focused on my little nearly four-year-old. What about my 10-year-old who's just about to move into adolescence? And adolescence generally kicks off around 11 to 13. So my daughter's at the earlier end of the stage, but she wouldn't be considered... Uh, um, too early. These days you can have kids going into puberty as early as eight and that's accepted as relatively normal. So what happens then is that this amazing stage of development in their brain starts. So you can see up here this, these diagrams of the brain. Roughly speaking, as it gets more purple, it's more like an adult brain. So you can see that right through adolescence, their brains are changing. And even if you look at the age 5 up to age 8, up to then 12, 16, you can see the, the change and how rapid it then becomes once they get from between 12 and right up to 20. So what's interesting is that adolescence starts quite young, but it doesn't actually finish in brain terms until quite a lot later than we might have expected it to start. Particularly, these areas at the front of the brain, the frontal lobes, are changing massively. The number of connections is changing. They're, they're pruning some of the connections. And this is where lots of more complex um, sort of understanding is kept in your brain. So things like the more complex emotions, things like motivation, things like impulse control are all dealt with by this part of your brain. So there's a number of issues that teenagers challenges, challenge, struggle with which are all related to the change that's going on in their brain. So number two to know about teenagers is to think about how their self-concept is changing, how their understanding of themselves is changing. So adolescence, their challenge is, as they come out of this egocentric phase and they start to realize other people have perspectives on them, is to answer the question of who they actually are. And in early adolescence, they're answering the question of, basically, am I normal? And they're comparing themselves to the other kids that they know. So at that age, they like to have lots and lots of friendships, big groups. And it's really hard if you stand out or if you're different, because that's the basic question, is am I normal? As they move on, it's a bit like, you know, the Trivial Pursuits games pieces? 
So if you think of um, self-esteem development, the early stages of self-esteem development are right back in childhood at my son's age when they're starting to understand some of those early questions about who they are. In adolescence, it's like they have to drop the pieces of cheese in. They have to put together their understanding of who they actually are. And they have this massive challenge because they are then flooded with information about who they are and also who they should be. So there is their own concept of what they think of themselves, but they also have this concept of what they think they should be like. And we see problems on the whole if there's too big a difference between those two things. At this stage, adolescents are very, very prone to messages that tell them what they should be like. So magazines, media stuff, anything. And they also, they lap up anything that gives them a strong sense of image. So the latest craze, whatever that is. And it's because they're literally trying to put that together in their own heads at that stage. It's about trying to find their place in the world as well. So as well as understanding who they are, they're trying to think about how they fit into the rest of the world, the rest of their friends. So you can see that this is a challenge. The next thing that we need to think about for teenagers is relationships. So their brains are developing and their understandings of relationships is changing. So remember, early adolescents are coming into this phase. They have lots of friends and they really like to be the same as them. As they move into mid-adolescence and they get more able, they're starting to think then about more intense friendships. You'll see really intense one-to-one -one friendships develop. Of course, the start of romances as well. So you'll see some of those kick off. Interestingly, it's quite normal for kids at this phase to develop friendships that are so intense that it's quite hard to, to work out whether they are friendships or romances. And so you will see kids who develop same-sex friendships, mixed-sex friendships that are incredibly powerful at this stage. This is nothing necessarily to do with their sexuality or anything like that. It's just a normal part of adolescent development. Of course, what we know about adolescents is that they're doing this in a much more complex social world than most of us did when we were growing up. And particularly because of social media and um, all of the different ways they can connect with friends now, they're doing this in a 24-7 like, a world. So they are continuously exposed to their friendships and their relationships. And this is really stressful for the teenage brain because it's all about friendships at this stage. So that's quite a, it's, it sort of switches them on quite a lot. So if they're doing that all the time, it's really quite stressful. So as much as we can encourage young people to have breaks sometimes where they turn off their phones, which I know is you know, pretty much impossible, but it helps them to get some headspace, to have time to relax. Okay, number four out of five, so we've got two more to go, is to do with how teenage emotions are changing. So this graph represents teenage emotions. Some of you will have seen this before. So you've got 0 to 10 at the top with a happy zone. You've got 0 to minus 10 at the bottom with a sad zone. So this trace is a normal adult trace. This trace... That's it. So the, if I asked any of you to trace like your average day on this chart, you'd see something like this. The next one, the red one, is your normal teenage trace. So teenage emotions are much more brittle. They, um, it doesn't take much of a trigger to push them right up to the top, right down to the bottom. So I always say to teenagers, what's, what's sad about our, our age is it takes a lot more to get us really excited, us grown-ups, you know. We have kind of good days, but we very rarely have those awesome days, really exciting. Teenagers all the time up there. What's good about being our age is that it takes an awful lot to get us that low as well, doesn't it? Most of us, some, if, obviously if you've had problems or life is chucking some really difficult stuff at you, you might find yourself down there. But on the whole, a normal adult trace dips maybe up to minus one, minus two. Teenagers, however, will dip all the way down to the bottom as part of normal, a normal week. And traces like this is what leads a lot of teenagers who come to see me to say that they think they might be bipolar because they really identify with that up and down emotionality. But actually, it's just a normal part of teenage life. It does get better. Okay, and number five, last but not least, is that one of the things that this frontal part of your brain controls is your ability to link something you do now with a consequence that happens later. And teenagers, and in fact, this is one of the last abilities to develop, so running right through into early adulthood, sort of early 20s even, this has been shown still to be not quite up to the adult level. They struggle to link things that they do now with impacts that it has later. So, therefore, they are risk takers. They're not very good at thinking things through. So whether that is going out driving when they've been drinking, whether it's sleeping around, whether it's just not studying now for the test they have next week, they're not very good at understanding that stuff. 
What we also know about the teenage brain is that it is more susceptible to a lot of the substances that can have an impact on the brain. So alcohol, drugs, caffeine is a massive one. So imagine, you know how much better you feel after your morning cup of coffee and then take that and like treble it and then treble the amount of caffeine because a lot of kids are drinking these energy drinks and you can imagine the impact it's having on their brain. It's powerful. So what we're talking about here for teenage life is something about resilience. We have to teach our kids to be resilient enough to get through adolescence. And that's not impossible. Kids have been doing this successfully for decades. The problem now is that they're hitting... Some of these challenges they're hitting earlier. Some of them have just become much more complicated. And the good news about adolescence is that it's a time for change anyway. So if I'm working with a young person who's really struggling emotionally, the good news is they're up for change because everything's changing anyway. If I talk to someone in their 40s about changing their self-concept or looking at the rules they live by, they tend to be utterly horrified because they've been doing this for 40 years. A teenager, they're like, yeah, sure, I could think about who I am. So that's the good news, they're up for change. The challenge is, is that lots is changing anyway and sometimes it can be very chaotic. But I want to encourage you, to, and just to finish on this thought, you know, this isn't just about helping our kids to survive. It's about helping them reach their potential. And what I see so often is that kids and young people who've hit emotional problems, it's like they've had to let go of their dreams. And that's why this stuff is so crucial. The more that you and I um, can help them to make it through this stuff, um, the better their chances of reaching their potential. And I just want to leave you with this verse, which you'll know very well, from John 8, 32, which is then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. I love the message version of this. And I think this represents our chance for adolescence. The message says, then you will experience for yourselves the truth and the truth will free you. It's not enough for us just to teach them the truth. We've got to give them experience. We've got to help them to experience not just the truths of the Bible and the truths of God, but the truth about who they are, the truths about their self-concept, the truths about the world that maybe they've misheard. We have to challenge some of the lies they hear, so we have to help them to get through. Thank you. hope that's helpful. I don't think